Good morning, everyone. I know the last 48 hours haven't been easy for many. I actually had to hike the vast trail to get to a drivable road to get to work this morning. And I know some reporters slept in their vehicles last night, along with many others due to I-89 being closed. And I appreciate members of the media for their work to keep Vermonters informed and safe. Next, earlier today, while overseas, President Biden approved my request for disaster declaration for all 14 counties. This will help mobilize federal resources to support our response and recovery efforts for this unfolding and ongoing disaster. Make no mistake, the devastation and flooding we're experiencing across Vermont is historic and catastrophic. Floodwaters continue to rise in some places, like our capital city, and have surpassed levels seen during Tropical Storm Irene. The good news is the rain has stopped in some areas, but that does not mean waters will immediately recede. They may, in fact, continue to rise. And even though the sun may shine later today and tomorrow, we expect more rain later this week, which will have nowhere to go in the oversaturated ground. So I want to be clear. We are not out of the woods. This is nowhere near over, and at this phase, our primary focus continues to be on life and safety before we can shift into a recovery phase. I know thousands of Vermonters have lost homes, businesses, and more. The devastation is far-reaching. Although the coming days, weeks, and months will be incredibly difficult, we faced challenges before, and Vermonters have risen to meet the moment. Whether during Irene, COVID, or other hardships, Vermonters have proven time and time again we're willing and able to step up and help our neighbors. We're already seeing that again here, and the spirit of resilience and goodwill will help get us through this challenge. So many Vermonters have been working around the clock, saving lives and helping those in need. We're all in their debt and will be forever grateful. But it will take all of us pulling in the same direction. So I'm asking Vermonters to think about how you can help locally. Even just checking in on a neighbor can make a big difference. So again, if you need help, call 211. Or if you're in a life-threatening situation, call 911. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Morrison and, uh, and our team for a status update. Thank you, Governor. For those of you I've not yet had the pleasure to meet, my name is Jennifer Morrison. I'm the Commissioner of Public Safety. I'll provide a situation update regarding ongoing threats and rescue operations. I will also provide some information about emergency shelters and volunteering. Rivers are creating severe flooding issues this morning, even along those that have not yet crested. It will take some time for rivers to recede. The Montpelier Barry area, as well as the Ludlow, Londonderry, Andover, and surrounding towns have been hit the hardest. Many other towns are experiencing significant flooding. Please stay away from the impacted areas as travel is difficult, the weather and water levels remain dynamic, and crews will soon be in the area working on repairs. Vermont's 13 swift water rescue teams have now performed more than 100 rescues throughout the state and they remain extremely busy. Additionally, five teams from Connecticut, Massachusetts, and North Carolina are in-state and assisting. More teams are en route to Vermont to assist with what will be a days or weeks long effort. In many areas, the water conditions remain too dangerous for rescue by boat. Five helicopters from the Vermont and New Hampshire National Guards are in the air this morning assisting in operations. They are conducting eva evacuations in the hardest hit and most remote areas that are not accessible by swift water teams and they are assisting as eyes in the sky. Do not take any chances. Stay away from rivers and flooded areas. Keep yourself and your family safe by staying well clear of damaged and flooded areas. There are countless road washouts around the state.
please respect all detours and never drive across a flooded road. Any individual reporting a life-threatening situation should call 911. You can find a list of state road closures by visiting newengland511.org. Uh, and I am not trying to steal Secretary Flynn's thunder, but Interstate 89 north and southbound has reopened. Vermonters can track river forecasts and levels at water.weather.gov. There's a longer email address that we can make available to you, but there is a way for you to go firsthand and track the, the level of, waters, uh, of water in rivers. And furthermore, residents and visitors to Vermont are encouraged to register for a Vermont Alert account at www.vtalert.gov to receive up to the minute safety warnings. We have structural collapse teams staged across the state, as well as fire and code inspectors who are prepared to deploy as soon as the water recedes to ensure impacted buildings are safe. We have state troopers deployed throughout the state and patrol zones are being constantly adjusted to allow for statewide coverage regardless of road closures. Troopers have been exceedingly busy with assisting stranded motorists, performing welfare checks, and reconnoitering the state's roadways. We will be deploying unmanned aerial aircraft to assist in locating stranded persons, as well as to assess flooding and its impacts. As of 9.30 this morning, no injuries or deaths have been reported. I want to reiterate that we are still in the earliest stages of this disaster. Our focus is on saving lives. There are areas that are still being evacuated and there are life-threatening isolations that we are trying to identify and rescue. There will come a time that we will need the help of all Vermonters to recover from this disaster, but we are not there yet. For now, please focus your volunteer energy at the hyper-local level. Check on your neighbors and the most vulnerable in your neighborhood. Your best move today is to either register at vermont.gov forward slash volunteer so that we can contact you when the time is right, or affiliate with a reputable disaster relief organization directly and become part of their team. Only deploy when you have been given a specific volunteer assignment. Please do not self-deploy. Floodwaters are receding, but there are still many hazards out there. Please do not become someone in need of rescue. Before I turn this over to Colonel Poirier, I want to say a quick word about shelters. If you are in need of shelter, you can do one of the following. You can call Vermont 211 or follow the direction provided by your local officials. Or you can go to an open shelter. In addition to 15 locally operated shelters, there are currently three state-run shelters. They are the Barry Auditorium, the Rutland High School, and later today, the Hartford High School will open. My closing words are this, stay safe and take care of each other. Uh, good morning. I will be very brief and give you a quick update on what the Vermont National Guard is doing right now. I think it's important to um, start with just the iteration that when the Vermont Guard deploys in response to an emergency, we do so with the Vermont Emergency Management. We don't work on our own. So anything that we do is with complete conjunction with what the state is doing. We currently, as the commissioner said, have very uh, varying aviation assets in the air. And those assets are working now to keep eyes in the sky and to help with some recovery efforts. We also have a quick reaction force or a QRF already deployed and working with Mr. Cannon with Urban Search and Rescue. And I will turn it over to Mr. Cannon to give you the update on that effort. Thank you. Um, so I'll just start out with, um, to go over some numbers on the rescues. So um, to date, we've done uh, collectively 117 rescues, um, 67 plus evacuations of people um, from uh, flooded homes or businesses or vehicles um, and uh, 17 animals. Um, 
those have been conducted by both our local, state, and federal partners that are, are joining us in this disaster. Um, we are still um, in a, a, a very uh, dangerous part of this uh, a disaster. Um, we are uh, performing active rescues as we speak uh, today here. Um, we, we still have reports of people trapped in uh, flooded homes and vehicles um, in some of the areas that the commissioner and the governor have previously mentioned. Um, as the commissioner um, indicated, we have 13 in-state swift water teams. They are all deployed or activated at some level. Um, and we also have the state USAR team uh, operated uh, and activated at full level. We also have six other um, out-of-state um, entities, both state and federal um, urban search and rescue teams that are now in and operating. Um, we are operating 24 hours a day, and we have been since 5 p.m. or 3 p.m. on uh, Sunday. Um, we have five rotary uh, wing aircraft um, operating currently, um, two with hoist capability, which will be beneficial for us for areas that we cannot get into, or if we come across areas that's going to be too dangerous for a, a swift water boat crew to uh, work work with. The other three aircraft are doing reconnaissance right now, and uh, we're going to use them also for um, areas that we can safely land and do evacuations. This is going to be a very long-term search and rescue operation. I expect this to take at least several days, if not longer. Um, as the sun has begun to shine, um, we ask that you please um, not ignore signage. We ask that you not um, venture to the waterways. Um, and again, this is an extremely dangerous situation um, around any of these flooded waterways. I will say, please do not drive around any barricades uh, indicating that the roads are closed. This morning at approximately 3 a.m., a swift water rescue team from New Hampshire performed an extremely high-risk rescue on Winooski Street in Waterbury, where a person had driven around a properly barricaded roadway and the car was washed off the roadway almost into the river. Um, that team um, took a considerable amount of time to safely uh, rescue that woman from that vehicle. Um, I cannot stress this enough. Please, please follow the direction and the input from local and state authorities regarding road closures and safety decisions. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> At risk of running or sounding like a broken record, I just heed everything you're hearing about the warnings. This is very serious. When I spoke yesterday, there were 24 state roads closed that I reported on. Today, there are 78. I won't read the entire list like I did yesterday, but I will tell you by region. We have five regions at AOT, the four quadrants of the state, and then the center part of the region of the state. In the southeast region, we have 18 closures. In the central region, we have 20. In the northeast region, we have 18. In the Northwest region, we have 14. In the Southwest region, we have nine closures. Additional key routes that are now closed are Route 2 East-West in Marshfield, Route 4 in Rutland, Route 2 in many places from Middlesex to Essex, Route 7 in Middlebury, Route 62 in Berlin at Hospital Hill, and Route 15 in Cambridge, Johnson, and Wolcott. This is not to imply that other roads are not of significant importance, but these are major routes that were added. As Commissioner Morrison said, good news is worth saying twice, uh, and I will. The good news is I-89 southbound is now fully open, and I-89 northbound is open to one lane at this time. Where water appears to be receding, and it is not receding everywhere, and it may rise again, as the governor said. But where it is receding, AOT garage personnel are beginning to gather information on roadway and infrastructure condition, as are our project managers and technicians. Once we can see what has been flooded, we will have a better idea 
as to the condition and potential damage and the work that's required to restore that. Our immediate priorities will be as follows. The National Highway System first, east-west routes second, principal arterial roads and feeder routes third, routes supporting hospitals and other critical resources fourth, and town and local roads as able, but the agency's position is it will render all assistance it can to towns and local communities. And I also would like to just mention that independent contractor partners across Vermont are ready and able and willing to step in, and they will, and we appreciate that. Thank you. We'll uh, open up to questions at this point. Can you talk a little bit about what happened on the interstate? Was it the Winooski River? Was it, uh, at one point it was a rock slide, water over the river, or water over the road? Can you talk a little bit about what happened there? Yeah, I can let uh, Secretary Flynn talk about that a bit more, but, um, but it was water coming off the, the hillside heading towards uh, the Winooski. Uh, which is on, as you're going north, on the left-hand side. So it impacted uh, that area, uh, went over 89, and uh, when you can't see it, obviously, uh, you have to close it off. So it was unfortunate, uh, but, um, but it was the right thing to do, uh, to life and safety in mind. Secretary Flynn? As the Governor mentioned, just uh, north of Exit 8, there's some rock ledges on the right-hand side of the northbound barrel. and. I, when I went to the EOC yesterday for the 11 o'clock press conference, the water was coming across there like a waterfall, coming down onto the ditch. And eventually it just started cascading across the road, which does create an unsafe condition. And also on the southbound side, there's a bridge, and we needed to be able to inspect that bridge before we could open the southbound lane. So our local Capital Region District 6 crew was on that at daylight. And we are restricted at this point to one lane northbound while we determine the edge of the roadway because uh, erosive water like that can wash away uh, and undermine the structures and, you know, potentially compromise the asphalt. So that's why that one lane right now is closed. There was reports of a fatality in uh, London Dairy last press conference. Was that confirmed to be not um, actually a fatality? I don't have any information on that at this point. Yeah. It, was, it was not. Yeah, it was not. Okay. It was not. Good, news. Yeah. Good news. Can you talk a little bit about what communication has been like between the state and local communities, especially when it comes to road closures? Well, it's been happening very quick, um, as you well are well aware, uh, this didn't start until Sunday afternoon and uh, came fast and furious after that. We're trying to keep up, uh, but it's very localized, as we saw on Friday, for instance. Um, I went down to view the damage in the Killington Bridgewater area then, and uh, going down through Bethel, uh, you wouldn't think anything had happened. Uh, but just a few miles away, uh, and uh, there was a significant damage along Route 4 and 100. Uh, we saw that a lot during Irene, and this is because of our mountainous region. Um, you never know which side of the, the mountain is going to, to come down um, and because of, uh, of the rain and so forth. So, again, we're doing our best to keep up, uh, to alert uh, the communities as, uh, as we can. Uh, but um, but it's hard to keep up when it's coming down so hard. I might ask uh, Mr. Morrison or others to might want to add to that. The neat thing about um, the resources on New England 511 and uh, VTAlert.gov is that citizens and local officials alike can be notified in almost real time of, of these things. So. Um, we are in regular communication through the State Emergency Operations Center with our regional and local emergency planning uh, partners, um, and the, our communication is, is regular. It is the cadence of our uh, information we're pushing is um, quite, quite quick, as you can imagine, as we are still rapidly evolving in this disaster. So um, 
Secretary Flynn, do you have anything else to add to that, or are we? Just really quick. What I would add is that um, each of our nine AOT districts has a number of towns in each district, and our garages have very good rapport with the local highway groups in their district. We have tried to reach out as we are able. We will intake information from those towns as they are able. Uh, the RPCs are part of this as well, which are managed through the SEOC. And so as all that information is gathered, um, you know, we start to get situational awareness on what's happening in the towns. It's communication can be difficult. There aren't always people available to answer the phone in small towns because they're out doing something. Uh, so it's tough, especially when you can't get around to all of them. So at this stage of a response, it's uh, very chaotic at times. But uh, we're doing our best at, at VTRANS, at least, to make that communication. Governor, talk about the, uh, the uh, emergency operations being closed down uh, last night and, uh, and why that was. And, and is it back up and running? Yeah, um, it was the uh, the access to and and from uh, the EOC center. So uh, the complex in in Waterbury was surrounded by water, but it wasn't impacting the buildings themselves. They've been hardened enough, uh, so they withstood that. Uh, but uh, but there was water over the road on both uh, the east and the west. So we thought it was prudent, uh, so we could get people in and out and not impact uh, the local response uh, that we should exercise some of our our um, continuing operations uh, plan and that's why we're here today but we'll go back uh, there as soon as the water recedes a lot of people have been calling this irene 2.0 i know it's still uh, a little early to see the full scope of the damage from it but does that seem like a fair comparison i think it uh, i think it is and i might uh, i might measure that a little bit different I, i'd say it might be more like 4.0 um, because, as I said in the, the previous press conference, Irene um, had about a 12-hour duration of, uh, of rain, and uh, then it was over. The sun came up, everyone went out, we were able to assess the damage, everything was receding, and uh, we went uh, back towards uh, the recovery phase. This is different. Um, we've had uh, like 48 hours of steady rain of that same intense rain that we saw during Irene. So four times the amount of rain. Uh, and, uh, and again, we had pre rain previous to that that we didn't have during Irene. So the, the ground was already saturated um, for, for the storm, and it's been raining ever since. Uh, and that's why I'm very concerned uh, about the next few days. Uh, we will have the sun uh, coming out this afternoon. Uh, people will think this is over, but it's not over because uh, the rivers could still rise. Uh, the water has to go someplace. The reservoirs are filling up, and we have to determine uh, the next uh, the next phase, the next wave, and and that's going to be more rain on uh, or they're predicting uh, on Thursday and Friday. So depending on the intensity of that rain, uh, and it has to go somewhere again, has to be stored somewhere. Um, it'll be in our rivers and then uh, upstream uh, to our reservoirs. So that's that's giving us a lot of concern. But we're monitoring the situation. Uh, we should uh, we should know. Uh, trying to make a, you know modeling what may happen with the the worst case scenario. Um, so we'll be able to communicate that over the next couple of days. But we will get a little bit of a reprieve here uh, and get around. But um, but again, I just want to make perfectly clear. This is not over. Governor, there's some warnings about dams also on that state front. Uh, talk about uh, how you folks are monitoring the dams and what you're going to do for people below those areas. Yeah. Well, again, uh, that's when I talk about the reservoirs, I'm talking about uh, those dams as well. Um, so we are, we are monitoring those. We're working with uh, Green Mountain Power, the Public Service uh, Department, and others. And uh, some of them are controlled by, by FERC. Uh, some are controlled uh, by Green Mountain Power and utilities. Um, and so w we have to, uh, to work together uh, to make sure that we're monitoring the situation, which we are at this point in time. So again, Wrightsville is uh, getting up to the stage where we'd have to open up uh, some the gates uh, to alleviate 
uh, the, the backup because we don't want anything catastrophic to ha happen with the dam itself. But I think it appears at this point in time we'll be able to uh, work our way through that without uh, having to open up those gates. But again, it's, it's Thursday, Friday, uh, depending on the rain intensity then. Uh, that's going to term, determine what we do next. So we'll have time uh, to to alert uh, everyone in the down uh, downstream areas that will be affected if that happens. But I just want people to be aware of the, the situation we're facing. Governor, what's your plan over the next few days? Are you going to be holding a daily briefing like this? And uh, do you have any plans to tour um, part of the parks of the state? Yeah, um, well, first of all, um, we will continue to have these these briefings. Uh, until the emergency uh, phase is over. Uh, so we'll continue to try and brief all of you uh, so that you can communicate uh, to your your followers, uh, which is incredibly important. Um, I will be touring at some point. Um, I'm not sure when it's going to be. Uh, there might be, um, you know, we, we talked about uh, some aerial viewage first, but I don't want to be part of the problem, right? Um, so we want to make sure uh, that we're, we're taking care of business first. Uh, and then uh, get out to see the communities and see what we can do to help. But we have resources on the ground, uh, and we're, we're getting that feedback communication back uh, to the SEOC as well as to our office, and uh, we're doing uh, what we can to, to assist. Uh, but uh, we'll continue to communicate with you. Is there any concern about insurance companies' ability to absorb these kind of damages and what might happen to premiums going forward? Well, there's always that, uh, but that will be in the recovery phase, and uh, we have a, a department uh, that uh, financial regulation that will be assisting us uh, along the way. We've been through this before, so uh, we'll be uh, leaning on those resources as well. This might be a little bit too early um, to talk about, but in terms of when we rebuilt from Irene, mitigation methods were put into place that, you know, were an attempt to help us fare another Irene. Do we know if those mitigation methods worked? I, I, th really? I think so far, I would say for the most part, yes. Um, some of the upsizing of culverts, uh, some of the, uh, the areas where we didn't rebuild again uh, was helpful. Floodways were expanded. Uh, look at uh, again. Again, we're not through the, through this yet, um, so we'll have to see what happens after Thursday, Friday. Uh, but take the Waterbury complex, for instance. Uh, a lot of work was done to create more of a floodway behind, harden the building, raise it up, and uh, so far so good. Um, but uh, but we'll see what happens uh, later in the week because again, this is not over. But for the most part, I think everything's working out well. Uh, I will see what happens at this point in time. I'm not seeing the number of um, bridge structures, failures that we had during Irene. Um, I think a lot of it is going to be in the communities, in the storefronts and, and the downtowns uh, that are going to be impacted maybe the most. All right. Thank you all very much.